and uh, can I just check if my audio is working okay? Loud and clear for me. Okay, that, uh, that sounds good. All right, well thanks uh, again, just to sort of echo that. Thanks everybody for joining for this uh, Storytelling in Social Leadership uh, webinar. It's going to be a fairly relaxed um, hour. Uh, you're welcome to interrupt with questions as we go, or you can leave it to the end. What I try to do in these webinars is take us on a tour through uh, the subject. I'll relate some of it uh, back to the uh, work in the Social Leadership Handbook and the Social Leadership 100 Days book, but I also like to use these webinars to bring in some new material um, and some new ideas, as well as uh, some of the case studies. So we'll see. Uh, we might not get through the whole slide deck. We might just um, uh, sort of stop and uh, explore an area in greater detail as we go. Uh, I'll just put some context around this. I'm running these social leadership webinars in a series of 12, uh, which kind of run through the year, um, through from foundations uh, right through to social leadership in practice. Um, the nine uh, sections that go from curation uh, through to collaboration follow the nine uh, components of the social leadership model. This, I, I went through the full series of these in 2017. So the first webinars, if you like, are all on YouTube. Um, if you can handle hearing me uh, talking about the same subject twice, then you can dig those out. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of updating the content as we go. But here we are on number four, which is storytelling. And I have to sort of admit that storytelling is one of my favourite um, subjects, really, favourite parts of social leadership. Because when I was putting together uh, the work on social leadership for the first time, I very nearly called the book The Storytelling Leader. Um, it is sort of very influential. In fact, storytelling is kind of very influential on uh, a lot of my work, on social learning, on social movements at scale, um, and of course on social leadership. But when we talk about uh, being a, a storyteller or storytelling in social leadership, uh, I thought I'd, I'd share this illustration, which is one of the ones I did, one of the first illustrations I did actually for the 100 Days book. And um, I hope that it, uh, the, the blue triangles are meant to be megaphones. Maybe I could have drawn them slightly better, but it's to, it's to illustrate uh, the noise. You know, we, we clearly live in very noisy environments. So one of the simple definitions of storytelling in, in social leadership that I use is to help us filter the signal from the noise, to find a way. And that notion of finding a way is quite important. It's not just individually how we keep our head afloat, you know, how we find our way. It's certainly not about things like email management. It's about collectively how, how we find a way. And I kind of tackle that from two main perspectives. One is the notion of sense making. I'll come back to that um, in a minute. And the, the second is the notion of um, finding a way through the noise ourselves, the so sort of individual capability, which sometimes I, I put under social capital. So social capital and sense making are two important notions. Social capital is your individual capability to survive and thrive in this new world. So your ability to understand uh, validity, authenticity, uh, ranges of sources, your ability to be an effective storyteller. All of this comes under social capital, but the second part of it is your ability to build social capital in others. And I've incorporated that notion very, very centrally uh, in, in the idea of social leadership. So it's not just individual capability, it's distributed capability. So if you're the sort of person that helps others su to succeed, if you invest in your community without expectation of immediate reciprocity. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's not a transactional investment, it's a relationship investment, then you're building social capital at scale. So social capital um, is, is quite an important notion in that sense. The uh, so, uh, sense-making, that other piece I mentioned, sense-making is about collectively figuring out, so what do we do with this new information? What's this actually about? And we, we obviously have individual sense-making capability. 
So when we learn, we read new things, we hold those things up against what we already know to be true, and we kind of make a judgment. Do I believe this new thing or do I still believe the old thing? It's kind of a simplified view of, of what we do cognitively when we learn. We either evolve our frameworks or we, or, or we keep them as they are and reject the new knowledge. But one key difference in the social age is we're less dependent on our individual uh, sense-making capability. We can be more dependent on our collective sense-making capability. And it's a small step from that to realize that uh, a key skill of social leaders is therefore to build and maintain and support the right community that they have around them. So if we just surround ourselves with with a, a subset of the, the wider population. We may only have one perspective in our sense making. We probably need a more diversified uh, strength. And, and just a small aside at this point, because there's quite a lot of commentary in uh, popular media at the moment about uh, echo chambers and about um, confirmation bias, effectively saying that social media puts us in these narrow, uh, spaces where we just hear the views that we want to hear and of course there's there's uh, truth in that that, that that many of the technologies of social collaboration do allow us to build communities that we know but it's a mistake to think that just putting us in diverse communities will cause us to change our views there's some very interesting research on this out of um, Duke and Princeton over in the US which looked at political opinions in particular and it took people uh, out of their, um, their specific groups where they were just hearing either Republican or Democratic views and put them in mixed groups um, for a period of time to see if they did indeed relax uh, or, or become more liberal in their views. And in fact, the opposite was true. They became more entrenched in their uh, initial position when they were exposed to that difference. So that's quite interesting. As with many aspects of the social age, um, the solutions that we're seeking, the new ways of being in the new world are going to be complicated. Um, it's not going to be simple. So it's not as easy as saying, expose yourself to difference, because once you have exposed yourself to difference, that doesn't mean that you'll automatically become wiser or more liberal. Uh, it may mean you just realize conclusively that everybody else is an idiot and that you should just listen to the people you know. So there's, there's more than that. There's a specific capability. Uh, and I'm starting to scratch around some of this. You know, what's our capability in holding stories of difference? What's our capability in holding stories of dissent? These are the kind of areas um, that I'm, I'm personally most interested in at the moment from a, a research perspective. Um, how can we build out some of these techniques that practically help us to engage in this difference because time and space and technology alone are, are unlikely to be the answer so there we are it was fairly early in the session that i managed to distract myself uh, with that but i think this is a an important area um i i, I put this one in i can't i can't uh, run a, a session on storytelling without putting this in because again this is one of the very early illustrations i um, I, I put together for the uh, Social Leadership 100 Days journey. But it's also kind of one of my favourite because it speaks to the way that stories convey power. They're almost used as projectiles to throw against each other. So, you know, somebody shares a formal story here and I counter it with a, a social story over here. Um, a big story comes down here and a subversive story comes up here. So we, we kind of fire stories out into the, into the system. And we don't just fire them out as mechanisms of information. Um, so it's worth thinking about what is a story. Um, sometimes I say a story is the, the basic um, cultural unit of the transmission of information. We package information into stories and, and share them around. But it's, it's a bit more nuanced than that because stories don't just hold um, data or don't just hold knowledge they also have context they are biased in particular ways they are imbued with certain types of power um, they can of course uh, carry hostility they, they can um, have an overt um, or, or um, I guess implicit um, mechanism of power sitting behind them so you can't really think about stories and storytelling 
without considering underlying types of power, what sits underneath the story itself. Um, this uh, piece here is, is uh, a reflection on the dynamic tension. And uh, again, if you're uh, interested in that, if you look on, on the blog um, and just search for dynamic tension, you'll find a couple of articles around dynamic tension. And I use that term to describe the intersection of formal systems and social systems. So formal systems are ones which sit under our control. Social systems are ones which sit outside organizational control. Uh, of course, we exist in social systems. That's, that's uh, how we come together. And in the, the research around trust, I've been looking at what the structure is of those social systems. Um, I might come back onto that later if we have, if, uh, if we have time. But in formal systems, we, we use hierarchies and we use formal storytelling structures and we use formal types of power um, in order to um, in order to, um, to, to push our stories through. And, and what I'm trying to show here is that many of the stories we're involved in for social leadership sit outside of that formal structure. The, the blue dots here are, are an icon I often use to represent people within a, a system. And uh, Nexa here has asked, uh, I, uh, sorry, Neha, I have not pronounced your name correctly this time, sorry about that, um, has asked for uh, an, some examples of social systems. Well. Let me um, give you a few examples. I'll start by saying this. We belong um, concurrently to multiple different um, social systems. So one social system you belong to may be a team structure. So within a formal structure, you may be in a team and you all talk, so you form a, a social system. Another social system may be members of previous teams you were in within that organization. So you have a, you have a social um, structure which exists outside of your current formal role within a, a system. But then there are things like alumni groups. So you know, maybe uh, from previous education you've been through, previous experiences you've had, you remain connected to some of those people. Um, if you're interested in this, if you uh, search on the blog under modes of social organization, you'll be able to see a few pieces I've written on it. I'm, I'm using a, a taxonomy at the moment, which is almost certainly wrong, but kind of represents my uh, most recent thinking. And it, it talks about individuals come together in strong trust bonded structures, which I'm calling tribes. So tribes are, are very strongly trust bonded structures and exist very independently of any form of structure. Communities are meta-tribal structures, so I don't want to get too nerdy here, but um, communities are made up of multiple members of multiple different tribes. So communities may be formal, may be social, may be somewhere in the middle. And above communities come organisations, and I'm using organisations in this context to talk about everything from team structures through to nations or organised religions or organised political parties. So we organize in multiple different levels uh, between those things. Um, within, uh, oh, and to your other point there, the, um, there'll be a recording of this webinar. It'll, it'll go online, um, hopefully within a few hours of us finishing. Um, and that link will be shared out to everybody that was registered on this, um, on this webinar. Now, authenticity is uh, something interesting for, for two perspectives. One is just to understand the nature of authenticity and how we grow it. And the second is to understand why it is hard for organizations to have authenticity, whilst it's relatively easy for individuals to gain authenticity. And it was that thought that um, was behind this illustration. When I was trying to represent authenticity um, for one of the books, I thought about what well, is a bit like a tree it's the roots that go down underneath the story so all stories have roots but if it's highly authentic those roots may be wide and deep and very strong and if the uh, the power behind the story is, is inauthentic or if it's very shallow authenticity then the roots are also very shallow it's, it's it doesn't have much substance to it now 
Um, authenticity seems to be important. When uh, I, I've been able to survey around two and a half thousand people in, in a te uh, technology company recently looking at what the top traits are they look for in um, social leaders, uh, the number one trait they look for is authentic storytelling. So it's clearly deemed to be um, very important. Another figure which is quite interesting is from a separate piece of research. Um, so uh, over the um, last quarter of 2017, we did a, a large scale piece of research on communities in the National Health Service in the UK. And this looked at where people find their communities and uh, how they are effective within their communities. And one of the angles I was looking at was storytelling. And uh, we asked people what they needed in order to be effective storytellers. And, and what was quite interesting to me was fewer than 1%, so less than 1% of people said they needed examples of good stories. Now I'm taking that to mean that people generally understand what a good story is. What they overwhelmingly wanted was coaching um, and mentoring support around storytelling. So they didn't just want an example of a good story, they wanted some actual support to develop their own storytelling capability. I thought that was quite useful and, and really practical and applied, putting in place um, that space. Authenticity also has another interesting context, which um, I again looked at predominantly last year in the research on trust, uh, and specifically to look at the relationship between trust and authenticity. So if um, an individual is deemed to be speaking, acting, uh, sharing stories with great authenticity, we may be more likely to trust them. But if, they, uh, if we subsequently discover that the authenticity is lacking, that something was made up, we don't just drop down to a neutral position. We don't just say, well, I never used to trust you, and then for a while I trusted you, and now I just don't trust you again. It doesn't go back to that baseline state. When we are betrayed, when authenticity is deemed to have been cheated, if you like, we become significantly less trusting of that individual. And that's quite important because if we are, if you like, playing with authenticity, it's a risky game to play, uh, both from an organisational perspective and an individual perspective. Um, authenticity has to be earned. And whilst we can be quite forgiving of people making mistakes, if, if they're deemed to have, if you like, actively tried to cheat us, we're quite likely to react um, very badly to that indeed. Now, um, where does, where does authentic, the authenticity of storytelling sit? Well, as with most of your social leadership power, it, it exists in your reputation. So reputation is really the foundation of social leadership. And reputation is earned through our actions over time. Uh, reputation is not the, the words that we speak, it's the actions that we take. Now, th this takes us to an interesting um, question about social leadership, interesting from an individual perspective, but also actually from an organisational perspective. And I'm, I'm having this uh, conversation quite um, dynamically, actually, with, with uh, uh, an organisation at the moment. So, with your formal leadership power, when you uh, are, are, are engaging uh, through your position in the hierarchy, you are expected at a certain level to, um, to carry the formal organisational story forward. So uh, you can't really dispute every aspect of the organisational story when you're speaking with your formal power. But if you're using your social authority, if you're looking at, uh, if you like, the authenticity of your actions into your community, then you're faced with a bigger challenge because if we just carry formal stories into our social communities, we may be deemed to be lacking authenticity in our actions. If we try to carry that formal story into a social space without translating it to be relevant, to be timely, um, to be uh, authentic, then we, we can end up uh, losing some kind of, of credibility. And that's uh, a challenge. What it means is that as social leaders, we may have to come into conflict with the organization uh, more often. And that's difficult. It's difficult for us as individuals because it will invoke a certain type of consequence. 
but it's, it's difficult for organizations that want to develop social leadership. Uh, and this is the challenging conversation I've been having. Uh, an organization that wants to develop social leadership, but wants its social leaders to convey and push forward the formal messaging of the organization. Now, in my world, that's not social leadership, it's formal leadership. What they want is their formal leaders to be really good at formal storytelling. And I support that, you know, it's absolutely right that you want your formal leaders to be superb formal storytellers but social leadership is different if you try to push a formal story through that channel you erode the value of the channel and you erode the authenticity of the individual a truly socially dynamic organization is going to be one that manages to balance both it has great formal leaders telling formal stories using formal language in formal spaces but it also has an ability to hear um, socially moderated stories, to hear, um, to hear uh, voices of dissent, voices of difference. Um, and uh, Neha's got a, a question here, a comment. There should be some rules, policies of social leadership. Well, you know, maybe, although perhaps what I might say is that, that, that whilst there are rules and policies of social leadership, they're not owned by the organization. In fact, for me, this probably takes us down to the fundamentals of social leadership. In your formal job role, if you're given a title and you sign an employment contract, then you give the organization an inherent permission to put rules and policies around what you do. But that's not the case with social leadership. But there are, of course, still what you could call rules and policies, but they are put in place by the community itself. So it's social uh, frames of acceptance. It's socially moderated uh, viewpoints. And if you breach those social rules, you don't face formal sanction because you've not broken a formal rule. You face social sanction, which is where you can be excluded because of the thing that you've said. So both systems are governed by rules, but the rules of formal leadership are owned by the organization. The rules of social leadership are owned by the community itself. Now, this illustration comes from a body of work I've been developing over the last uh, five years or so, actually specifically in military contexts. So this is looking um, at a piece of work I've been doing in, in the US about uh, the types of power that sit behind uh, different systems. And I share it here because it's quite relevant for social leadership. And I'm, I'm really differentiating between these three. There are different, there are types of power that go beyond this, but I'm just looking at these three. So your individual power, if you like, is your, your charismatic power. Charismatic power is what we have uh, with our friends and our family. Um, it's that kind of personality, force of will. Uh, charismatic power is very strong, but it's also extremely localized. So we just tend to have small groups of people that this operates within. Within a formal role, of course, we have hierarchical power. This is the artificial construct we've created to scale um, charismatic power or individual power into global organizations. So we take that power and we put it in a system of rules and consequence which is codified. So the further up the ladder you are, the more you can invoke consequence on those beneath you. So hierarchical power is infinitely scalable. You know, you can run a, a nation of a billion people with hierarchical power backed up by formal rules and the rule of law. But it's not the only type of power. Hierarchies are quite susceptible to disruption. You can kind of break a hierarchy if you fracture it in enough places um, or if your lines of reporting and communication become too long. The, the other type of power is, is the power of social reputation. It's networked power. It's reputation-led authority. So this is individual power at scale within social networks. And the reason why it's at scale is because if your reputation is strong and I carry that reputation forward from you by sponsoring you into new places and new communities, then um, it, it scales up very fast. It's probably the type of power that sits behind celebrity, um, that certainly that sits behind uh, global communities. So networked power is contextual. 
it's consensual of your community, it relies on democratized um, uh, channels of communication and a high redundancy in that communication. So the ability for there to be multiple different channels, all of which are outside the control or oversight of any formal organization. So the struggle between these types of power is significant. The um, uh, organization gives you hierarchical power, but your community gives you social power. In fact, we can think a bit more about this, about power and control. Generally speaking, in the context of the social age, we are, in, we are living in an evolved um, domain of power. So we are generally seeing the erosion of formal power and control. The power and control of organizations, even of states, um, is being eroded. And it's being, we can clearly see why it's being eroded, is because of the connectivity and social amplification effects of social communities. So our ability to collectivize outside any system and to form and share views and opinions really radically favors the emergence of social movements, consensus-based authority, social storytelling at scale, and all of which plays against formal stories, dominance of storytelling spaces, and formal control. So we can still have both, but it's easier in today's structure of power to um, it, it, it's, it's easier for the individual social voice to hold the formal voice to account. Your question here, is social leadership different to digital leadership, as mentioned in the Deloitte Human Capital Trends? Well, um, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I'd say this is still a, an open question. For me, it's different. Um, you'll see that all of my work is contextualized in the social age. And in fact, I'm very clear to say I think we're substantially through the digital age. I think that most conversation about digital leadership and digital learning is a red herring. It's focusing on technology, whilst in fact what we're seeing are evolved modes of sociology. It's not to say that technology is not incredibly important. It clearly is. But what really counts is what we do with it, the ways we are with it. So I, I tend to um, look beyond... Uh, the digital. I'd also be really clear that you exert social leadership in physical, real-life spaces, not purely through um, through digital channels. So we're probably talking. Um, I, I would say that you know, digital leadership to me is a, is a kind of a trend. It's a, a term to differentiate leadership through technology, but still within formal spaces. But when I talk about social leadership, I'm talking about socially moderated leadership in any space. So in fact, to be really clear about it, I, I, I typically would say we need fantastic formal leadership. We need to continue to work, to build and develop and grow out formal leadership in formal spaces. But in parallel to that, we also need social leadership, which is this reputation based form of authority. And the socially dynamic organization of the future will live in a dynamic tension between these two types of leadership. We don't want to relinquish either of them. In fact, we need to recognize, empower, and facilitate the building of, of social leadership. We're seeing more generally this rise of social authority. We're seeing uh, the democratization of permission. So no longer do you need to wait for a formal organization to give you permission, you can increasingly claim a permission backed by your social authority, even if the formal organization doesn't want you to do so. That's quite a, a key part of this. We're seeing increasingly decentralized power, um, power held within communities, and of course, as I said, democratized types of power. So you'll have heard me talk a little about different types of story. And I'm using this uh, illustration, and I've got a couple of slides after this just to uh, show you as well. At a more practical level, we can think about three levels of storytelling. Your, your personal storytelling is the story that you tell. It typically carries the high authenticity of your, your charismatic power. Um, it's, it's quite granular. It's quite micro in some senses, just my story of the truth but we all have one. The second level is the kind of co-created community narrative. So what do we collectively think? And 
co-created narratives differ quite substantially from personal narratives. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Organizational narratives are the formal organizational stories. So they uh, often have very high production values. They're broadcast through the formal system, but they may lack that um, direct uh, authenticity. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, the, the um, personal story <coughs> represents you know, my story of learning and change over time. It's what I believe, what I need, how I feel, um, you know, what I'm going to do, what I have done. It, 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 personal stories can mark out uh, change over time. So personal stories are, are very important. And I use this context, uh, this concept in social learning, uh, because in social learning, we need to create spaces for individuals to capture their personal story and evolve it uh, over time. Co-created narratives uh, differ in one key way. So a personal narrative is inherently uh, internally referential. So if I choose to evolve my view over time, that's okay. It's my view. I can change it how I like. So if I change it, that's all right. It's part of an evolving narrative. Co-created stories are rarely stories of consensus. So it's unlikely that we would come together and write a story where we agreed on everything. A co-created story captures that sense-making, captures the meaning we find in the community, but as much as charting agreement, it charts our disagreement. And I've been developing this out uh, in a few areas, um, and I'll just share two with you briefly. One is diagonal storytelling, and the other is stories of difference. And you'll find uh, articles explaining both of these in a little more detail on the blog if you just search for uh, diagonal stories, uh, diagonal storytelling and stories of difference. You should find something on, on both of those. But diagonal storytelling is where we really actively seek people out across the senior layers and through layers down the organisation. And we co-create stories that move between the, 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 the different levels. So we may first of all build out a horizontal story. So, you know, our understanding of, of uh, for example, competition at the exec level, our understanding of competition at a leadership level, our understanding of competition at a, a, a junior level. But then we build a diagonal story where we get people at each level to respond to the stories shared in those different places. But crucially, we don't do that to drive consensus we do it to document and explore and create a space to understand our difference and that takes me to the other area which is building stories of difference and this is something i'm interested in at the moment looking at change uh, especially in the national health service here in the uk is how can we build out of that stories of difference and this is a specific leadership capability for social leaders to go into their network to, um, to find people who they disagree with, to um, put together a story of what our disagreement is. So we can chart our consensus, but we also chart our difference. And what we can inadvertently do is create or document our, um, our, our problem space, you know, where our difference is. What you'll often discover is that people agree on more than they realise they agreed on. But by teasing out those areas of disagreement, we can, uh, we can do something about it. Organisational stories are often you know, owned at the top and pushed down through the organisation. Organisational stories should really be written by reading personal and uh, co-created narratives. If the organisation just writes its story in the abstract and pushes it down, it's missing a trick. If it writes it by listening, um, then it's going to be more grounded. It's going to have a, a higher authenticity. Now, um, this, uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, this model, this is the, the net model of, of social leadership, which I've used in both the first and second edition of the uh, social leadership handbook. It's not intended to be a, um, a definitive view of what social leadership is it's kind of meant it uh, meant to be um, a, a, a developmental journey or a journey of how we build our social leadership uh, authority. I'll just sort of quickly walk you through this. Um, 
I start on the left here with curation, saying, uh, you know, choose your space. So this is an important thing. In the formal system, you're given a space, but in the social system, you can choose your space. So that's a, a curation type activity. And you'll see that storytelling comes in straight after that, because a storytelling leader uh, is going to be a leader who understands how stories work. Firstly, they can shape and share their personal story. And they can do so understanding the power of their story and the way that stories spread through systems. Secondly, they're going to be very effective in co-creating stories, and they're going to have this high level of social capital. So not just sharing their own view into a system, but helping others to, to shape and share their story coming out. They will hold difference safely. So they will be able to hold spaces of disagreement and dissent. So you can see why I put, I hope you can see why I put storytelling so early in the process. And then sharing, of course, is about sharing, not to add noise in the system, but to add signal, to add detail and clarity. So sharing the co-created story, countering the formal story, sharing with humility that personal story. In fact, as an aside, I'm working on a few different books at the moment. I've got, uh, in about six weeks, the Trust Sketchbook should be out, which is a, a rather fun creative venture, looking at a, a building a co-created uh, exploration of trust. It's a 26-page book that you graffiti and fill in yourself. So I've drawn half of it, but I'll get people to, um, to fill in the other half themselves. So it's a co-created guided journey. Uh, then I'm uh, just working at the moment to try to complete the change handbook, which is looking at co-created and co-owned change. But once that's done, uh, I'm going to uh, share a very short book, uh, which is called The Humble Leader. And it's only two and a half thousand words. So I'm positioning it as a reflection that you can have individually and uh, with others. And it's going to explore this notion of humility in social leadership, finding power in being wrong and in uh, both sharing and accepting our, our limitations. So with any luck, that'll be out uh, later in the year. Um, the, uh, the rest of the model runs through community, you know, finding our communities, growing communities where we need them, leaving communities where we don't need them. Understanding communities is important. Uh, and again, if you're interested in that, I, I've referenced earlier the research we did on communities last year. Well, I'm working on a short online publication called The Community Handbook, but I have been uh, working out loud and I've shared some of that on the blog recently. Uh, so if you just search for uh, community on the blog, you should find the most recent posts um, uh, sharing some of, that, uh, some of that work. And that digital publication should be out in the next couple of months, looking at um, how we create the conditions for community. Then reputation. Uh, understanding reputation-based authority and how that reputation leads into social authority. And of course, then how that social authority acts as a counterpoint to or an amplifier of our formal authority. And then these pieces at the bottom here, which may seem quite distant from storytelling, but they're really quite important. Co-creation, the ability to uh, come together to build our stories of consensus and our stories of difference and to do something with it, to co-create some new meaning. Social capital, I've, I've already referenced earlier, and collaboration is important. I'm just building uh, this out at the moment for a big uh, workshop that I'm running uh, in Munich uh, next week where we'll be looking at complex collaboration. So I'm differentiating between simple collaboration, which is collaborating with people that we know to do things that we know how, how to do so you know it's kind of known problems in known spaces can be solved by collaboration complex collaboration is the process of engaging in unknown spaces to do unknown things often crossing over into areas of difference so i think social leaders can be um can be very strong in helping us do that so let's just uh think a bit about the system where these uh, types of power exist um, i'm going to share two illustrations here uh, and really I'm sharing these as an example of working out loud. Um, this illustration was quite an early illustration that I wrote uh, that I drew I I'm going to say about four years ago um, when I was starting to explore storytelling in social leadership and I became quite fixated on this notion of nodes and amplifiers. It's the notion that to build an effective community it's not just a matter of scale you don't need a big community you need a community 
um, which has the right people in it and you need to share the right types of story into it. So this was the illustration that I used to start to represent that. So I was trying to show that outside the formal structure and I often use buildings um, to represent formal structures. And as I said earlier, I use these uh, circles to represent uh, communities and tribes and social networks. So this was my first uh, sort of look at this uh, to represent notes and amplifiers. In the second edition of the handbook, I've, there, I've sort of evolved this to talk about the dynamic tension. Uh, and I referenced it earlier, and this is the slide that sits behind it. And I very often use this as the very first slide when I'm working with groups to represent the formal structure, which is what you can see, own and control, and the social structure, which is where we're all inhabiting sort of outside the system. The dynamic tension between these two is what counts. So most of these points I've been making earlier have been about understanding the difference and operating in this middle space. Social leadership exists in this tension between formal and social systems. Your formal power can never colonize the social system. It just, it just makes the system formal. The social system shouldn't be allowed to fully subvert the formal, because if it does, you get chaos and lose the ability to generate momentum. So this is our challenge to build a, a balanced but dynamic system. Um, I just shared this for fun. This was uh, an illustration from the 100 Days book talking about signal and noise and, and ties into uh, one of these uh, key notions that we need as social leaders to share stories which add signal more than they create extra noise. Well, how will they do that? How will they cut through the static? Well, three areas that are worth thinking about, and these, are, of course, are not the only areas, are stories which are timely are always going to carry better than ones which are out of time. So you may share a story which is highly relevant, but just not in a timely way. That's less useful uh, to me than if it's shared at the right moment in time. Now, technology lets us access information and access storytelling in a more timely manner. So one thing social leaders need to do is understand sort of how that technology works and how they can um, act in that way. The context of storytelling is important. So again, is the story shared in your everyday reality? And if you look at um, communities for learning, uh, communities of practice, they are in your everyday reality. That's much more valuable very often than in abstract spaces like learning spaces where we are outside our everyday reality. And of course the relevance, so sharing a story to a small number of people may be more powerful than sharing it to a large number if it's highly relevant to those small groups of people. So understanding something of that is important. Now this uh, illustration here is one which I've, well, I've really tried to relate two pieces together, which are um, storytelling and types of power. And I actually used this in an article about uh, President Trump looking at communication in the social age. And this is fairly obvious, I realise, but it's just illustrating this rebalancing of power. Um, so historically, within a formal structure, and we can consider government as a formal structure, individuals would interact with these channels of media, the formal media that interpret and, uh, that they, and broadcast the story out. This is the sort of typical way that um, senior leaders share stories in formal organisations. Of course, what we've seen in, in both the US and UK political systems, almost certainly as part of a a wider evolution of democracy itself is individuals engaging directly through social media into their community. So they've, they've effectively shifted the axis of power. They've cut out the, the middle space. Now, that brings both benefits and challenges. On the one hand, anybody can be a leader in this context. If you've got a very relevant story to tell, you can subvert the formal system. You don't need to wait for CNN or the, the New York Times to pick up on it. You can broadcast it yourself. If your community is strong enough, if your authenticity is deep enough, if the message is relevant and timely, it may be picked up and amplified. Um, but of course, we've lost some of the checks and balances of formal media. So none of this is neutral. It all carries consequence and context. 
But what I would say is that this is how storytelling operates uh, in the social age. Um, I, ju I just wanted to, uh, as I start to, to draw us uh, towards the end of the session, just think about uh, what do storytellers do? Within our social communities, we don't need storytellers just to share stories of consensus. We don't need them just to share stories of agreement. We need to share stories of difference and similarity. We need uh, to create shared storytelling spaces where we can safely disagree with each other and respectfully do so. So perhaps as individual social leaders, that's what we should be seeking to do, to hear stories of difference, to recognize and respect that difference, and then to help us together understand where the similarity lies. It's not really about revolution, it's about slowly drawing us, um, drawing us forwards. I've been doing some work recently about cultural graffiti, and I, I've shared an article on this recently, and actually I've been running a few workshops on it that I've really uh, quite enjoyed. And it comes out of a notion, a storytelling notion, which I mentioned on the top left here, the notion of claimed voices. I've been working for some years now um, looking at graffiti as the ultimate democratised mode of storytelling. So, you know, you can be given a voice by a system or you can claim a voice and graffiti can be a voice which is claimed when you have no other. You need nobody's permission to be a graffiti artist because the power of graffiti is almost exclusively held in opposition to the system. So in fact, your very act of trying to deny me a voice actually empowers and enables me to claim that voice. So graffiti is a voice of dissent. Why I'm interested in cultural graffiti is that in the real world, we understand where graffiti exists. It exists in liminal spaces, at the edge lands, it exists on the back doors of warehouses, on the sides of trains, on underpasses. But within our organisations, do we understand where the cultural graffiti exists? You know, the voices of subversion, the countercultural voices, they're often very transient, very tribal, entirely hidden. But there's great value for us in, with humility, learning where to hear them. If we believe that cultural graffiti is just noise, is disturbance, is intransigence in the system, and we try to stamp it out, then we're missing the point that cultural graffiti is a barometer of social opinion. It is the stories that people are afraid to share with us directly. A wise leader, a humble leader certainly, will engage in those stories of difference, not to correct them, not to dominate them, but to actually learn from them. So uh, I'm quite enjoying playing with uh, notions of cultural graffiti at the moment, and we'll continue to, to build that uh, work out over time. Ah, Rosa, the, um, the notion of dance is fascinating. Um, I'm very interested in this. In fact, I'm, I'm looking at the moment in, in pulling together a very small prototype event in September, which will be a day of uh, storytelling through performance. And it will be uh, doing that performance with uh, some dancers and musicians against a background of sculpture. So I'm going to run it in a sculpture park uh, with the idea that sculptors um, effectively capture a storytelling in a, a, sto a, a solid, often static form. Um, but dancers capture it through movement. And there's a link, and I apologize for uh, anybody that's not interested in either dance or sculpture, but there's an interesting thing if you interview. Um, sculptors or dancers, they often use a common narrative. So some sculptors describe that when they look at a, a block of stone, for example, they try to uncover the form itself. So the form, the solid form, is the thing that they are creating. Other sculptors use the solid form to define the empty space around it. The best way I can describe that is when you think about a building. If you think about a building, we often think of a building in terms of the physical features, the walls, the roof, the ceiling, the marble, the plaster. But another way of looking at a building is in a series of interconnected spaces. So if you think of a building as space, then the physical form becomes incidental. It simply defines what the space is. 
Now, the interesting thing here is that dancers do the same thing. On the one hand, you can see that dance is about um, where you position your body and it's using the, the physical form to, uh, to tell a story in the form of movement. But dancers also will sometimes use the movement of body to define uh, a space in a, in a dynamic moving way. Um, so that's uh, very interesting. So Rosa, your, your, your point is, is fascinating. And if you're interested in that, there's a little bit of writing on the blog about dance. Um, and if you drop me a note, I'll, uh, I'll link you through to uh, some other work, or perhaps we can find time to have a, uh, a, a talk about that. But there's a proud history of people using music and dance and indeed art um, as a form of dissent uh, and a form of subversion. Um, which relies on a shared cultural grammar. If you're not in on the joke, you wouldn't know that it's being subversive, but it often uses a grammar um, of subversion uh, that can be quite, quite fascinating. Um, the, uh, and uh, Neha, uh, after this, um, uh, Sam, I think my uh, crewmate is gonna send out a link to all of the uh, other webinars. So to the tw um, 12 webinars from, um, last year and the, the webinars from this year as well as some other resources um, and Rosa you'll find you'll find me easily online or um, uh, just uh, ping me a note afterwards and we can we can uh, share some stories around that so we've got uh, just a few minutes left um, so let me just jump in here actually so uh, a, a context that I'm uh, using stories in at the moment I just thought I'd share this as part of uh, my newest work is looking at this model of change. I said I'm, I'm working on the change handbook, looking at how a story of change should be a central narrative. And here, here I'm looking at change. Um, uh, the, the orange line in the middle is the formal story of change, but in reality, change within organizations is a whole series of interconnected social stories. So if we really want to help organizations to change, we need to uh, find ways to hear and benefit from all of those stories. So this illustration is one which I did uh, a couple of years ago in the early stages of work on that book. Uh, I did about 70 original illustrations, but what I'm actually going to do is once I've finished the text, I'm gonna redraw all of the illustrations. And I've been thinking about this quite a lot, but it's, uh, it, I found it quite valuable uh, as the last stage of writing a book to redo all of the, if you like, the working out loud illustrations to bring them together in a common visual language as well. Because quite often my um, illustration style varies um, over time. So I did it for the first time with the social leadership uh, handbook for the second edition. I redid all 74 illustrations, I think. And although it was a bit of effort, um, I think they looked much nicer for it. And more importantly, I think the story is more coherent for it. So. This, if you like, is a sketch that would evolve into the, uh, one of the final illustrations. And my, my final uh, slide here, final illustration, is, is this one, um, which is uh, the notion of experimentation. When we think about storytelling, perhaps much of what we need to do is find spaces for experimentation, claim permission or be given permission, uh, find ways to hold each other safe, whilst we experiment. If we continue to do the things that we've always done, then of course we'll just get the results we've always had. As we seek to navigate our way uh, into and through the social age, we need to experiment with new ways of storytelling, new ways of leading. So that's really the end of our journey through uh, storytelling today. Um, I've put some contact details up there. If you have any questions, we've got a few minutes now for questions or you can always uh, reach out uh, direct. The um, next webinar which Sam will give you details of when we've been looking at, uh, at sharing but thanks for uh, thanks for being part of the session today. Sam over to you. Thank you Julian thank you for an uh, enlightening and fantastic review of storytelling very interesting and thanks to everyone who's attended who's watched and commented uh, and made this a very interactive webinar. Thank you for your time. Julian mentioned the next webinar is sharing. Uh, for your calendars, that's the 18th of May, and that's 1.30 p.m. UK time. Uh, there'll be a link in the email that comes out to you for that to help you sign up if you haven't already.
Um, so unless there are any more questions, uh, thank you to Naya and Sarah as well. Thank you. Just commenting there in the channel. Um, I think, I think we're done. So thanks everyone. I hope to see you next time. That's the 18th of May. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.